Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Derek Pernasiglio Show. I'm Derek Pernasiglio, and this week's guest is none other than two-time Wheeling Southern Modified Tour Champion Andy Sice joins us in the studio. Thanks for coming in. Long time no see. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, when was the last time you and I ran into each other? I'm trying it, to remember. It's been a while, you know, uh, the way our lives have changed over the last few years and where, where we're at in the sport and life and all that. But, Tell uh, me about it, it. It's been a little bit. <laughs> I think it's been like two years almost. Probably, Just yeah. with the pandemic and then all the stuff that happened to me and my family. And it, yeah, it's been brutal. But yep. uh, anyway, uh, great to see you. Thank you for coming in. Uh, I know you had a huge ride all the way down here from Welcome. Uh, everyone knows you, you know, as a modified racer, but fill the listeners in and, and the viewers on what you're doing now. Uh, well, this year I, I took on the role as car chief for uh, College Racing's number 16 cup car, which is a new venture for them. They were part-time, you know, last little bit. Uh, they ran about half a dozen races last year. And this year they made the, the big jump into full-time cup racing, two teams, new shop, new bunch of stuff. And it was pretty flattering to be, you know, kind of cornered by Chris Rice one day um, about coming on board and, and taking this role. And, uh, you know, it, it was really neat to just kind of know Chris in passing at the racetrack. And when it worked at Trackhouse and they were housing RCR last year, just I guess he, he saw me and, and thought that this might work out. So appreciative of the opportunity there. And it's been a lot, you know, with the new car and everybody's heard and read about part shortages and you know then again of course new team new car new everything and learning and and trying to play catch up so um hadn't really allowed me to do much racing myself but uh also a dream job you know if i can't be driving then it it is a pretty uh pretty humbling um great opportunity that i'm very thankful for well uh, that was the goal uh, coming down here was to drive uh, you know for a living uh, you did the you did the the the, the smart uh, not the smart the southern modified tour for quite a few years with uh, eddie harvey and uh <clears throat> then went arca racing because you kind of like looked at that as the next step but um what uh tell us take us through the steps of the decision to go arca racing uh getting hooked up with our motorsports leaving there and then now being in the cup series um, it, it actually kind of stems back to, you know, like you said, driving for Eddie Harvey. Um, you know, I'd have to go down to the Raymock racing shop every once in a while, pick up a motor for Eddie. They were supplying motors at the time and um, got to know Brian Doe's a little bit. And, you know, I needed, needed a job when I first moved down here full time. And they hired me for 90 days to uh, redo Brian Doe's modified. And I walk in the shop and I got my my coffee going and I walk around this car and realize this this thing's in pretty rough shape and when I'd get hired to build a car for somebody I wanted to make sure when I left I felt confident I could hop in it and perform the, the way I had been performing and I kind of looked at that car and I said this this thing ain't winning not with me not with Michael Stefanik <laughs> not not Ted Christopher not nobody and right. uh it's it's good days are over and they said well there's this new chassis in the corner we just hadn't put together so um, I put that car together for Brian Doza. You know, he, he was happy with his progress and the 90 days turned into a year, which turned into a life, lifelong friendship. But just in conversation with him, um, I said, Brian, how'd, how'd you get, you know, into modifieds being from Louisiana? There's, there's no modifieds out there. And I said, is that your goal? Is that your dream? And he said, no, I, I want to run Daytona. And I said, well, then go run Daytona. And he goes, no, I, I can't do that. I got to do so many years in modifieds and then, you know, move up here and move up there. I said, no, I said, you know, you just go to the Daytona test. And as long as you don't crash, you know, they'll, they'll approve you. And then you can go to the race and try to get in. And next thing you know, he, he sent uh, myself and Todd Cooper with a little trailer to Ohio. We found this, this old used speedway car for less money than most people spend on a street stock. In we were Ohio. Go Daytona. It, racingjunk.com is amazing you can <laughs> you know uh the budget wasn't wasn't like go up to uh you know venerini's and pick up their their hottest car so right. we went there and we and we got a car and um started going playing at the tests and it was him driving and he let me drive every once in a while he then stepped up his game and did buy a, a car and it was actually 
Danica Patrick's ARCA car from JR Motorsports. Mm -hmm. Then that first car that we bought from Ohio uh, was sitting there and he actually presented it to me and said, here, I'm going to give you this car and this motor and this drivetrain and you go to Daytona, you got to pay the bills. So, you know, I made some phone calls and um, did what we could and, and we did the, uh, the driver development thing and had some people come in and testing and, you know, try to drum up some money that way and we went to Daytona and didn't make the show. This was driving Brian's old car. Yes. Um, okay. So that was disappointing. That was back when, you know, they had like 55 cars show up for 40 spots and you had to be in the top 30 in time. And it was the first year of the Ilmore motor and we had built motors and we didn't get in, you know. Um, but what was crazy was about the same time uh, Chris Hour was doing the same journey. And it was funny, we were at Daytona, me, my dad, you know, always by my side, helped me with whatever. We borrowed Cliff Gauman's 24 foot tag trailer. And, you know, we, we just like had to get in, didn't really think much past that. We didn't have pit support equipment. We'll figure that out. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it didn't work out, but right next to us is Chris Hour with the stacker they use on the wheel and modified tour with, you know, Brad LaFontaine and, and some really talented people from up north on his team. Uh, Greg Narducci was there and they qualified one spot ahead of us. You know, like we were in line and we just kind of got to talking and, and we had a, a mutual goal of Daytona and different things. And um, I think it was the following year I went, thought I was going to have a bunch of rides lined up for da- for Daytona. I was supposed to be in a truck. I was supposed to be in an ARCA car. I was going to have a modified down at New Smyrna. I mean, mm-hmm. it was going to be the greatest month of February ever. Right. Just a dream come true. And one by one, they, uh, they all went away. And I found myself just on the sidelines for speed weeks, kind of bummed out. And I said, okay, next year, I'm going to control my own destiny. I was still very focused on Daytona. I mean, it just was, just meant the world to me. And, um, I remember Chris's car we had drafted together in practice and I thought I had mine rolling through the corners pretty good and they would stretch me about half a car length. Who was driving their car? Uh, Tommy Barrett. Chris was, Chris had a lot invested in Tommy Barrett and was Mm -hmm. really trying to help him climb the ladder. But like I said, as a short track racer, I I didn't really understand the aerodynamics of it at the time or, or things like that. And the only thing I could focus on was getting through that turn. Mm-hmm. and you know just rpm drop and things like that through the turn and you know their their car was a little bit better so i called up chris and i had this scheme in my head that uh give me this race car and i will leave your name on it and i haven't seen this race car for almost a year and it must be sitting there and tommy had his issues and they kind of sidelined the arca program so the steel body cars were going to get phased out in a, in a year or two. So I said, rather than this thing sitting and, you know, being worth $1,500 somewhere in a little bit, let me take this car. And I didn't have a plan on how to get a drivetrain, and I didn't have a plan on really anything past that, but that was my first step. Chris Hour is a busy businessman, you know, he's got a lot going on. And I was actually in line, standing in line in Las Vegas at the Carroll Shelby Museum for tour. My wife had business out there I tagged along you know and uh I was just cruising around the rental car and I'm at Shelby and my phone goes off and I look down it's Chris Hour I got like 10 minutes to this tour that I really wanted to do and it was kind of funny I'm like all right well I, I better answer this so I answer we start talking it must have been two hours we were on the phone and here's a guy I couldn't get you know 15 minutes or five minutes you know he's a busy guy so all of a sudden and you know we kind of went over goals and by the end of the conversation he was ordering an Ilmore motor and we we're going racing together. So wow. I'm like, wow, I, what I thought was a phone call that would probably cost me money ended up being a great opportunity. Um, my parents picked up the car. It was in Pennsylvania at Bobby Gerhardt shop because they had worked together. Um, they picked it up in a borrowed trailer, dropped it off at my house. We worked on this thing. We didn't get the motor in time for Daytona. We got the motor four days before we had to be at Talladega. So I took this car that had never had a fuel injection system in it for an Elmore, never had an LS motor. The motor mounts were different. Had to plumb the fuel cell and and all this stuff. Put it in my dad's modified trailer. 
uh, Mike Holmes and some other guys from New Hampshire came down and we went to day to, uh, to Talladega and like, that's it. I mean, you know, second speedway attempt ever. Don't know anything about this stuff. All right. Did what I thought I needed to do and learn from it. And obviously that car hadn't made the race either. So it needed some work and, uh, practice 10th. I'm like, wow, you know, we must've, must've got a good draft, you know, obviously, but uplifting to run that fast, go out and qualify 10th. I'm like, wow, this car went from not making the Daytona field to top 10 and qualifying. This is pretty neat. It's a good and, feeling. Yeah. And, uh, With no super speedway experience whatsoever. No, just being there, helping out, um, try attempting, you know, race. I've done some tests and, uh, I'm in the outside lane. Nobody wanted to be on the outside lane. I just kept moving forward. People kept going to the bottom. Next thing you know, we're leading the outside lane. Like <laughs> we're in third, like charging up the outside. And I mean, I felt like Ricky Bobby and Talladega Knights. Like I don't know what to do with my hands. Like I, I never done this before. Yeah, what the hell am I doing here? Legit. Like I was just at Bowman Gray the other week. Now I'm at Talladega, <laughs> the biggest stock car track in the country. And, and if you screw up. And yeah, you know. well, you don't think about that. You know, I was, I was, I don't know how old, but invincible still in my mind. And, you know, you don't think about those things, but, um, coming to pit road and we had to back off a little bit cause we were in the outside lane. We had to get to the bottom, coming to pit road, green flag stops and, uh, heard a loud bang and the car didn't slow down. And I hit the guy in front of me, right? Because I'm a modified driver. So when I realized I got to slow down, I said, well, there's a rear bumper. All I got to do is square up my front bumper. <laughs> spin him out. I spin in the grass. Fire the car back up, get to the pit road. And I'm like, man, I can't believe I screwed that up. I thought I slowed down plenty of time. You don't want to be that guy. I was that guy on TV. Right. And, uh, well, we get to the pit stall and there's the boys are taping up the hood where it got caved in and there's brake rotor laying on the ground and my dad goes uh pump the brakes oh they're soft yeah i don't think there's any brake rotor between those pads <sighs> so we were done uh we parked the car and it was funny chris hour couldn't be that there that day he was on vacation with his wife and in florida with the narducci's and he had to be watching on tv oh they all were okay I mean, right. it, like so this was a huge thrill to see i mean i i felt that hug through the phone okay and i mean here i am i just wrecked this guy's car right i didn't know what happened i guess um in a last ditch effort to make the daytona race when they knew they were down on speed they banded the rotors and anybody you know in nascar world mechanic that's been speedway racing is going yeah yeah you band the rotors well i didn't know what it was I, I was so green i didn't know to look for it didn't know what it was they were tiny little thin 810 rotors banded and somebody later on told me, yeah, you can do that in qualifying, but you got to cut the band off for the race. What do you mean banded? They, to, they, to the they people just, that don't know, you know to the listeners, they what do they mean? What is put that? a piece of sheet metal in the veins where the air runs through so, so that it doesn't cool. In the fins? In the in the rotor, in the inside. Okay. Um, and so basically it didn't cool, and it was such a lightweight, thin rotor that it was could only be for qualifying, and then you got to take them off for the race. Well, I didn't, like I said, I didn't know. So first green flag stops. It sounded like a bomb went off in the car, but like, I, you know, back to Ricky Bobby, not know what I'm doing. Maybe this is what it's supposed to sound like. I don't know. All I know is everybody else is slowing down and I'm not. Mm -hmm. And uh, like it, the brake pads grabbed the rotor. So, I mean, I was on the pedal hard. It was there. And then once I let off the brake, it let the rotor fall. Ah, and okay. I should have taken a picture, but the only thing left around the rear end was the two sheet metal bands hanging from just thin rings of sheet metal hanging from the rear end housing. So... It was a it was a big uh, learning curve, you know, but the the good thing was, I mean, Chris Hour was was back hooked on racing because he had kind of bowed out there and sold his modified stuff, and you know it was it started off slow. It, it you know we didn't do another race all year, and then we went to Daytona the next year, and we did Talladega and we did Chicago, and then after that we're doing Daytona, Talladega, Charlotte, Chicago, Michigan, you know, Kansas, all that stuff. Um, built it up right at my house no i know that was like the big story that they were doing on tv yeah the, 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 the guy famous who, boat shop with yeah, no boats the, in it the guy yeah the guy who builds cars in his boat shop yeah yeah, yeah the and, boat mechanic yeah and mm -hmm. uh i mean which which was true i i you know it's every racer's story i mean i moved down i didn't i didn't have a job you know you you have to be flexible so 
I literally put ads on Facebook and Craigslist and uh, about being a boat mechanic. And I would take work when I had time and really needed money and kind of turn it away when I was busy racing. And um, there was plenty of boats there. And there were days there were boats side by side with the race car. And I'm just very lucky that the race cars became more common in that shop and in making a living that way than and the boats kind of bowed away but I still have one pop in every once in a while I'm just so busy that I actually feel bad I take so long fixing people's <laughs> boats so I just tell them well if you can't get anybody else to do it I'll help you out but for the most part I, I turn the work away now I just got a quick question though did you get your money back from the Shelby tour ticket no <laughs> no well worth it though you know I mean I'm I'm just bummed out I didn't get the tour you know uh, I'm, I'm big into the history of of all kinds of racing and Carol Shelby's an interesting person, much more than just the Shelby Cobra. You, you know, I mean, in, right. in his racing career. So, Winter someday. Of Le Mans, oh know. yeah, yeah. Right, Some, someday uh, I'll get there. But it was worth worth the uh, putting that tour off. But going back to the racing, the big highlight, I guess you could say, from the whole Arcading, the Arcadeal was uh, the second when you finished second at Talladega. Uh, that had to have been huge moment for you tell us about how all of it unfolded was that the same car you were using and yeah you know. yeah so that was uh and the crazy thing about the car chris's car was very good it drafted well it did not um didn't have raw speed i would say like obviously we qualified well but it just didn't have that throw down we are one of the fastest cars here but it drafted like a mofo like that thing sucked up on other cars and um as i learned you know, that first race, I didn't know what I was doing, but as I learned, I learned how to pull other cars in front of me to the right and you keep pulling them down the back stretch and you can get them. You could tell like their car, if you keep tucking to the right, a, they're looking in the mirror and they're wondering if you're going to go three wide on the outside. And, and, but I really feel you can pull that car over. You can make them think they're driving straight, but get it out of line. And then I could attack you mean and with the air. The yeah. You, you get them to move. You can kind of move them if you got close enough and, get them to just want to steer to the right almost and that car was awesome at then then going to the bottom or or you know filling the hole in the middle three wide and so that that car was really good it was a 1996 diamond ridge bush car wow and in 1996 the bush cars were 105 inch wheelbase arca cars were 110 so at some point in its life somebody stretched it Mm -hmm. and did this and it was a downforce car just you could tell by the roll cage and somebody made it a speedway car so it it, it kind of suited our style you, you know like it, it wasn't the brand new ronnie hopkins or gms or kbm chassis that people are using now i mean it's it that thing had been through the ringer um we, we had made it better every time every time out we we did better with it which mm -hmm. is something i'm proud of you know we didn't make daytona then we got in like last on speed one time, then 20th, then 8th. And last time we, we ran ARCA, the last race I ran, we put it on the front row at Daytona. Right. So that qualifying right. speed we we did get. Um, that day at Talladega, Matt Weber was the crew chief. There was rain. Um, we didn't run full time. We had to start 33rd out of 36 cars. It took all day to get up into position. Um, you know, obviously luck on your side at some point. But... <clears throat> still running out of my house, still working on it with my parents, with my dad, um, you know, definitely a small team. In front of us was Justin Haley in an MDM car with Kevin Bellacourt as a crew chief. Right. And it's kind of funny now, Kevin Bellacourt's crew chief in Cup at, at Spire. Um, MDM was a superpower. And now... Right, I remember. Now, I, I car chief the team car to Justin Haley's cup car. So I joke around with the guys. I'm like, man, if I just beat him that day, he'd be working on my car. I'd, I'd, you'd be putting my decal on, on that roof and he'd be pushing my car in, into the trailer. But uh, it was it was great. I mean, it wasn't a fluke. We had great speed. We were building the car better and better every time. It was MDM car pushed by a Venerini car with a Gibbs car with a Cunningham car. I mean, like, right. it, and then that and then little unknown deal. Little yeah shop deal. it was uh it was pretty special we partied pretty hard it was a great time um you know I've, I've replayed that last lap in my head a million times and what i could have done differently and uh 
you know, also in my head, it probably ends poorly 95% of the time. Thinking about what you should have done. What I could have done and <laughs> probably wrecking half the field. But, um, you know, it, it's it's a great day, you know. Well, you never want to be leading on the last lap of a super speedway race. It's no, just... and I, I just couldn't couldn't get the run. You know, I, I just couldn't get it right. Um, like I said, I, I, I've i replayed it a million times. I'm not giving away all my secrets, what I would have done differently, because, you know, may, maybe I'll, at 35 years old I'll get a shot at it again. But, um, you know, what could have been. And in reality, that, that propelled us pretty good um, to grow in our motorsports. We got drivers driving our car. We got sponsors on our car. Right. You know, we did some races as a two-car team and obviously expanded into Xfinity uh, before I left there. And, um and that that that, uh, that second place had a lot to do with it. The 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 moving up to the Xfinity series. I mean, I remember when that announcement was made, and you guys were going to do that, and then a few months later, you made the announcement that you were going to leave. Um, I'm sure it was a heartbreak for you, but I don't think you realized how many other people were so heartbroken by what had happened because like I was, cause I'd wanted to see it happen for you. And a bunch of your friends and family were, I remember talking with them about it and that head, they'd get that head shake and they were just so down about it. How, what, what happened? Why, why did you leave our motorsports? Um, well, I mean, it, 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 it's been an incredible ride with the support I've had, like you said, friends, family, fans, um, to this day, you, you know, about that deal. And, um, obviously the announcement, uh, Chris wanting to do that was a dream come true, right? Like most of my life's been a dream come true. I'm a very fortunate person to say it's, you know, greatest day of my life. Never thought this happened. Like I, if you've got more than one greatest day in your life, you're doing pretty good. But, uh, it was all good. It was amazing. It was an amazing ride. Everything was happening the way it should. Um, I think, honestly, the stress uh, that maybe Chris Auer had on himself about the money he was spending, which we all know is quite a bit to do it at that level. Um, so the pressure to succeed. And then uh, and then at the end of the day, uh, hiring the wrong people that got the year of the boss. And then he lost faith in, in myself um, and the people that made his team what it was. So when we were running that team, it was five people, including me. And I wasn't even a quote unquote mechanic. I didn't really work on the cars. I was running the show. That doesn't mean I didn't help assemble cars here or there, but I also worked literally on the hauler. I worked on the truck. I worked right. on the trailer. I remember you boxes. building I remember you building the apartment in the shop for guy for the crew members to live. Yeah. Like, the, I, I remember the, that. You know, there were offices, there were bathrooms, there were parts rooms that we made. Um, you know, and, and we put our little spin on it being a small team. How can we make this the nicest we can? Um Yeah, I mean it it just the guys that built that for him, which looking back, um Myself, a lot of help from friends and family that you know the deal. Short track racers aren't compensated. I mean, right. did it because they loved it, wanted to see it succeed. Um, John Marlott, my brother in law, uh, who I'm a big fan of, and, and you know, I'm very impressed with him, but because he was my brother in law, I got accused of looking out for him sticking up for him I mean I do it because I, I think he's an impressive person but well, he works hard too I mean I've gone by the shop and seen yep. them there working and yep. he, he works and at the time uh, Patrick Hutt who was driving from Arkansas to volunteer his time while we were Ar- Arca racing and learning the craft um, Brian Graham was was our, our first employee he was working for our motorsports when it was at my house I would leave and work on boats and other people's race cars and tell him what to do during the day, then come back and then do work with him um, just to make ends meet and all that. And and those guys, I really feel, again, back when, you know, the, the Harry Hyde stories of what he had to make when Hendrick uh, first hired him to make the cup. Well, that was 30 years before that, and we didn't make any more money than that <laughs> story of that Harry Hyde did. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, it's... I've, I've kind of always had a cliche that I'm just going to do things the way I did them on Blueberry Circle. And that's that's where uh, my parents' house was and where we, we built Modifieds. And 
when I first moved down, you know, people would tell me I was doing this wrong and I'm doing that wrong. And I mean, I, I had to learn how the air affects things and, and different things like that. But one day I said, you know what, like it's not bigger or better or smarter than anything we've done. We're going to keep building race cars like we did on Blueberry Circle. Mm-hmm. So we, when we went ARCA racing, you know, us, us guys that were volunteers and different things, we, we did well. And when we went Xfinity racing, we came out of the box well. And unfortunately, if you're not the guy that sticks out your chest and beats on it and tells you, oh, this is because of me, maybe the guy that's making the phone calls behind the scenes to the owner, he's the one that got the credit. And then we were all a bunch of idiots. Um, and then we weren't treated very well, to be honest with you. And I, when I tried to address it as the GM, uh, I realized my power was gone. And, the, you know, again, that is during the start of the pandemic. So, unfortunately, Chris Auer wanted to manage it from 800 miles away without ever seeing what was happening in the shop. And, like I said, when people are treated poorly, um, that's the biggest thing. I mean, we could could all work late hours. We could all work every day of the week. We we had a really good group of people. But when people are just treated poorly, lied to, and all that, it gets under my skin. It it really flips a switch. And um, there was a lot of lies, a lot of manipulation. You know, I hired the crew chief and that was the one person that, you know, I didn't list there and it probably will be the biggest mistake I ever made in my life. Maybe we could still be doing our motorsports had I not hired him, had he not filled the owner's head with a bunch of lies and all that. But at the same time, uh, I was disappointed that I wasn't given a, a chance to tell my side that I was instantly doing everything wrong that was told uh, me you, you know I thought the relationship I had with Chris Hour was stronger than that and he'd at least say hey you know you guys did really well with this what's going on now and I mean that's that's There's obviously nothing. while we're doing the last 10 I did 14 races so were you just getting phone calls and yelled at <sighs> put it this way I was told the crew chief would throw down on the owner behind his back and one of the, the one story that's kind of interesting I guess everybody has their NASCAR stories that you know things went bad and backstabbing um, he gets on my case. We need another motor, which we did need another motor. But, you know, I mean, budget's a budget, and if there's money, then we'll spend it. If, if it's not there, we can't. Need another motor, need a fourth motor in rotation. You need to tell the owner, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So we do a conference call at a table like this. It's myself, crew chief, and our secretary. And we call Chris Hour. And he's like, you need to tell him. You, you're, you're, the, you're the GM. So I say, hey, we need to spend this $35,000. This, this, this is why. Um, everything was good and Chris I said okay yeah I'll, I'll I, you know I'll make it happen some way somehow I'll make it happen what I didn't know was the crew chief up and left and uh, went around the building and called the car owner and said don't buy those piece of shit motors Andy's just trying to get his friends money wow so our motors actually and I to this day believed in the motor program we had it was not a ECR you know or, or Hendrick or anything like that but we went to the chassis dyno, same place people had the Hendrick A lease program the year before, and we, we compared notes, and they were very good. Um, we got the SMT data act system during the race. You can watch your car versus the ghost car like you see on TV and, mm-hmm. and video games and stuff like that. And once excuses were made of why things weren't great, and then you use that tool to say, well, no, hold on, that's not really true, the crew chief cancels it. We don't need to spend that money anymore. Um, and on and on and on. I, I could go on with a million stories, but uh, unfortunately, you know, that, that guy stayed there for a while. Chris Hour ended up firing him, I'm assuming, when he realized his true colors. But in the meantime, yeah, like I, I thought I had a friendship. I was promised a lot of things. Like I said, we'd, we didn't make a lot of money, but it was always when that, that, that first sponsor comes, you're going to get taken care of. When that, you know, funded driver comes, you're, you know, don't worry, we're not going to forget you. Right. And things got a little different. All the guys were kind of there f- for what money they could not go broke on. And people were promised things and certain things started showing up. And, you, you know, it, it just wasn't fair um, uh, on certain things. Like I said, and then it, it comes down to just the way people are talked to, the what, way people are spoken to. What em- emo- emotion were you feeling after all of this because this f- was for all intents and purposes your baby you built it it, it really was yeah, yeah. I mean uh, what was the biggest emotion you felt the most was it bitter was it anger was it frustration I, I all what? of it 
Was um, it just I'm done? Yeah, I, I probably. Um, I mean, honestly, like I, I probably slipped into some depression. Um, I never gotten clinically, you know, diagnosed with that, but I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't have to get out of bed. Um, I was owed a pretty good chunk of money when I left, believe it or not. And I wrote myself a check cause I had a bunch of signed checks and sent, sent the, uh, picture of the check to the, the bookkeeper up in Massachusetts, Chris hours. And he refuted it first and then realized, no, I, he, I was owed that money. So I didn't have to get out of bed cause I spent all that and I probably should have been smarter and paid off some credit cards and different bills. But, um, I was pretty bummed out. You know, the only thing I will say there, there was a certain, um, weight lifted off my shoulders for sure because it wasn't right of me to go home and be in such a terrible mood with my kids with my wife with everything it was it was bad well I'm sure you were asking yourself now what do I do right I I mean I I honestly thought it it was so weird I'm like am I making this up in my head and luckily like I said John was there uh, Patrick Hutt was there and sometimes they remember it worse than even I do so I know I didn't I didn't make it up in my head um you know, and but left there. The only thing I will say is it was like it was like a surgery, you know, for a pain in your, in your leg or something. Uh, you would not cut yourself open on purpose for fun, right? It was not fun what I had to go do, and there was a recuperation period. Mm-hmm. So I had to make that decision to kind of like get that out of my life. Um, it was terrible because it's all I worked for. For five years, I worked for, for Chris Hour And the racing dream, obviously, longer than that. And, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I if I questioned what I wanted to do next, my identity, all that. Financially, um, it was not a clean cut, this man paid for everything situation. I put my family in kind of a financial burden. Uh, my wife stepped up a lot and, and took care of a lot of things. And after that, it was kind of like, hey, you know, Whatever we do at this point over, you, you know, we, we, you kind of got to step it up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she wasn't wrong. She was just carrying carrying us for so long. And uh, my sister and wife got me a job. And my sister was cutting hair at Rick Ware Racing. <laughs> and it just in conversation, it was like, you know, uh, oh, Andy's not working. And, oh, we need somebody. And my wife's like, get out of bed. Uh, so I ended up working over there for the last eight races of 2020, uh, which is a lot of fun. You know, I, it's kind of funny, Rick Ware Racing, sometimes people can be critical of it. I loved my time at Rick Ware Racing. Mm-hmm. I loved working for Rick Ware. Uh, I loved a lot of the people over there. I worked for Crew Chief Jason Hotel, and I, I, I enjoyed him. I think he's a good person. Um, and you eventually, working over there, got your... Uh, got to your dream you got your first cup start no that was that was before that it was before that so and 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 rick rick and our uh, minds path have crossed a few times and i have nothing but good things to say about rick Ware. that's cool um and that all kind of stemmed from the arca deal i knew rick like you know with the flexibility of running the team like i i went to auctions and bought parts where you could you know and trying to save a dollar and rick was the same way and uh, it was funny, like, yeah, I was a player at the auction at ARCA level. And even though Rick Ware is not Rick Hendrick, he's still cup Rick, Rick Ware when he walks into a place like that. And he right. had a big presence and was always very nice to me. He approached me one day and said he wanted to put his son in an ARCA car. And this was Carson. And he kind of presented this deal about uh, you put him in the ARCA car and I'll put you in the cup car and no money will be exchanged no sponsorship and I'm like man I just I don't know I've never I mean people probably figured this out about me but I've never had luck with sponsors I don't I didn't know the right people I didn't know the right approach to it I didn't come from the right area where you know businesses and things were I just I never had a lot of success with it so even presented with a cup isn't that a pain in the butt though because people think you can find sponsors like it, it just like they come to me all the time like, find me a sponsor for this. And I'm like, I'm not a marketing guy. You know, I, I do media. Yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, probably three quarters of us in racing, even if we're not, you know, putting on a helmet that often or at all, we all set out to be race car drivers. And if we had sponsors in our back pocket, we'd still be doing it, even if we were awful and finishing last, yeah. you know. Um, but Rick, Rick came to me and I, I tried to find some sponsorship and I couldn't find it. Um, 
And I basically had to come up with enough sponsorship to pay for the ARCA deal. You know, so I had better TV coverage with the cup deal, but I had to cover the cost in ARCA. And to do it right in ARCA isn't cheap. You know, I didn't want to do right. it not right. Um, Chris Hour didn't have any interest in putting, you know, him paying the bills for Carson Ware to be in the car to get me a cup deal. That didn't happen. So, like many doors that I thought were open in racing, it, it closed. And it, at that point in my career, it just kind of had, like, I got over it. You mm. know, people would call me up and say, hey, you want to run, you know, this Xfinity race? Yeah, of course I do. Oh, well, I only need this. I I don't know how to get that money. Right. I don't know how to get a quarter of the money right. you asked for. I've never done it. So anyway, whatever. It didn't work out with Rick at that time. Well, he comes to me and says, hey, you're going to do the Charlotte test. First year Arca was back at Charlotte. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Can my son run some laps? Yeah, yep, no problem. No questions asked. Here's where the date is. He's got to do, you know, all his paperwork for Arca, but just be at the test. We'll make it happen. Okay. Kay goes out there, and he's actually pretty good. I think he laid down the fastest lap of our team for the weekend. And at the end of the day, Rick busts out a checkbook and says, how much do I owe you? I said, not a thing. And he looked at me, he's like, what do you mean? And I don't know if he thought I had an angle, if I wanted something right away. I said, Rick, you can help me out way more than I'll ever be able to help you out. Yeah. Just so here, just let me let me help you let out. Me do you've this been, favor you've been for good you. to me. You've been nice. And he's like, oh, man, I'll, I won't I won't forget that. Thank you so much. So a couple years later, he calls me up and he says, uh, hey, I want you to run my cup car. And I'm like, yeah, Rick, I know. Everybody wants me to run their car. I don't have any money. <laughs> yeah, how much money do you want me to bring? He says, nope, I don't have anything lined up for Loudon. So if I'm going to get zero, I'm going to get somebody that has laps around Loudon, people that will be excited because you've run Loudon and all that. I'm like, don't be messing with me. You, you know, nope, done deal. Sent me over the paperwork to send in. I mean, even the cost of a NASCAR Cup Series driver's license was a lot. And, you know, we made it happen in my family, but it it's a big chunk. The driver's um, license? The driver's license. Just the driver's license. license. What are we talking? Are we five, just under six, six grand. Wow. Yeah. Really? So, I mean. Uh, just the license. Yeah. So <sighs> then it was funny. Rick calls me up. He said, hey, what do you got for sponsors for Loudon? I'm like, oh, here, here we go. B- bottom's falling out. No, no, you're good. You've got the deal like we said. But here's the deal. When we don't have sponsorship dollars, you're going to run around on scuffs all day. He goes and, you know, and, and Rick's really good at pumping you up. So he's like a modified champion like you at your home <laughs> state. You know, I don't I don't want you running around there on scuffs. You got to do it. So I'm like, OK, I'll, I'll make it happen. And I made the most phone calls I ever made in my life. And um, dating back to uh, friends of ours that hadn't kind of lost connection with. But uh, the Bates family that owns Weaver Brothers Construction, that I raced against Adam Bates in go-karts at Sugar Hill. They bought a set of tires. Wayne Darling bought a set of tires. Right. He doesn't even have me put his name on the car because he doesn't want to know that. He doesn't want other people to know how nice of a guy he is. Dude, and Wayne's has helped awesome. Me out I worked for lot. him when I was in college. Yes. Yeah, he he great guy. Um, yep. You know, Chris Hour bought me a set of tires. And, and we did, uh, obviously, Rockingham Boat. My family's been amazing. Um no questions asked, you know, set of tires. So got to do it. And uh, yeah, that was just Rick being Rick. And at the time to, f- f- you know, fill in the people that are listening or watching, you had gotten the team their best finish ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was, um, this was a 105 degree weekend. I wasn't going to run the modified race at Loudon because I wanted to focus on this. So Everybody that knows me knows a joke around about probably not having the best body or in the best shape uh, of the athletes <laughs> Too on many the racetrack. Your mom's lobster rolls. Well, I mean, is. that's a good thing. We only got lobster when we won. Listen, you know, we always ate, your mom always made sure we ate good at the track. She, she hasn't stopped, even though we hadn't <laughs> raced as much. But um, I worked out four times for that race. I'm bragging, okay? That's like four <laughs> times more. <laughs> than most years because I usually try to get it out of the way in January to say I work I went to the gym this year but I went to the gym twice and I rode my bike twice wait, wait, you, wait you told me what your gym was you went swimming you yeah sw- you swam at the Y yeah that's not working out 
I don't know. I was sure out of breath but, by the end of it. Of course. <laughs> I tried to pull you in the gym many times. You just never, never. Time is one thing. Uh, I, I don't stop for much. I used to joke around <laughs> if I worked on my body the way I worked on race car bodies, I'd, I'd be in much better shape. But um, yeah, so did the race and 105 degrees. I mean, I the modified race was bad enough and that's, you know, open cockpit. You got half a windshield. Um, did the cup race. Got to, you know what, like, was, like, one of my favorite things. One thing, there was a number of amazing things that weekend, but one thing I was looking forward to, and people might think I'm silly, but is the pickup truck ride around the track. <laughs> and it was, it's, That's the 10-year-old kid in you coming out. It, it really That's probably exactly is. exactly what that uh, is. That's the fantasies I, of standing in the back and of it that was, truck. It was to- amazing. It was like I won the race and it hadn't started yet. Um, and, again, if I, if I got to give Rick credit for kind of, picture and all this if he called me up and say hey i want you to run kansas yeah of course i'll be there 100 percent. i can't wait right but it's and loud it, and, and everyone it, knows you well, there. it would have been amazing and i would have had the support online and phone calls and text but yeah like driving that pickup truck or riding in the back of that pickup truck around new hampshire motor speedway i never knew how many people liked me <laughs> it was pretty amazing <laughs> And uh, oh, because you you're from New Hampshire. It's a New Hampshire race. Uh, you're making your cup debut. I mean, you yeah, know, you've run so many modified races there. This is this is a huge thing. It it, it was, and uh, having my family out there, and you know, the race is kind of a blur. I was really worried I was gonna fall out of the seat. So I was like, you know, I don't want to say I was pacing myself, but I'm like, I can't give it all right away. And, you know, you're you're driving a Rick Ware car. It doesn't exactly drive as good as some of the front cars. So you got to work hard at it. Um, like I said, 105 degree day helped my finish because so many people wrecked on their own. And I like to tell people, I, I kicked Chase Elliott's ass that day. <laughs> and I did. I mean, we were laps ahead of him. I was laps behind the people just in front of me. But I was laps ahead of Chase Elliott because he put it in the fence. And a lot of people did. Uh, like you said, 28th place at that time was... Um, the best finish uh i remember getting out bubba wallace needed medical attention and a lot of guys I remember it was uh the chip ganassi team next to us that just kind of paid attention i must have known it was my debut race and uh they looked man you don't look too bad i'm like i thought this was 400 laps and uh, you know we all got a good laugh and yeah, i guess those uh, four or five days in the gym paid off they did. They did. Uh, I literally, I remember afterwards changing out of my suit and you lose so much water weight and it probably doesn't happen to, you know, muscular guys. But to me, it, I literally looked like a balloon that was like sagging because the pressure was let out after a few days. That's what like my belly looked like. And uh, uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. That's what it looks like when you lose weight. Well, I did for that day. That day helped me lose weight. Um, I went on. I didn't realize even at the time because I hadn't been working at the high levels of NASCAR. Like, it's a race when the race is over to load the car, Mm -hmm. right? I hadn't left. I probably looked like the biggest tourist. Everybody knew who I was. I was still in my fire suit and haulers were backing out. And I'm just walking (laughs) around the garage. And I mean, you know, I'm sure I got all kinds of comments. I'm a cup driver. I mean, like, yeah. (laughs) And uh, then went back to the camper, which we did in the driver owner lot for cup, which was pretty neat experience. And probably one of the coolest things is we all had beer outside my motorhome with Bentley Warren. Oh, how Bentley cool. Warren was the motorhome next to us. Bentley's the man, dude. It was it was it was amazing. Like it it doesn't get any better to the happy ending than Bentley Warren, I, I, right? Yeah, out of all things, like there's been Bentley Warren asked me how my race was. Right. No, I know. Like, just, like this guy. I know. I, I've had experiences like that where he actually, I watched him off in the distance one time at, at New Hampshire, turn around, see me, turn around and drive up to me and go, I wanted to come over here and say hello to you. Like, yeah. me? Yeah. Like, really? And I, I joke around like when I, uh, you know, get new guys, new teams or whatever, I've, I feel there's two kinds of people in racing, people that know who Bentley Warren is and posers everyone else yeah right. not, you, not real racers yeah you know going back and looking at your arca stuff uh, you know i i mean obviously you know my history with being the reporter for kane and in arca for so many years and, and all that and the guys who have come up through that is arca still can you still consider it a stepping stone to get to nascar uh, to to the top levels or is it just one of those things where 
you, you get pay to play. Um, yes, you can. There are so many factors um, to it. And obviously we know there's a boatload of incredibly talented race car drivers that aren't going to rise through the ranks. Mm -hmm. um, some is of their own doing. I do believe you have to put yourself out there. You have to go ARCA racing. For me, it was moving south, being a part of it. Um, I think Andy Jankowiak is showing that right now. And we've worked together, um, obviously, and in, in, in trying to help him with not make every mistake I made along the way, tell him what I should have done and all that. And he's doing really well at it. Um, and he's a great guy. Great, great guy. And such a personality, too. He, um, our relationship started when he wanted to buy a Speedway car. I had one Speedway car left, and I said, I got it in the divorce from Chris Hour, not my wife. Right, right. Um, <laughs> and he wanted to buy it, and I said, I'm not ready to part with it. And I said, but I think I know who you should talk to. And I mentioned Ken Schrader, and he had some other friends that knew Schrader. He obviously has won the Schrader Real Racer Award and had been nominated for it a number of times for that. So he puts together a deal with Schrader. And it's funny, I was still at Our Motorsports at our Statesville shop on the way back from purchasing the car. Him and Steve Mendoza stopped by and we're talking about it. And I mean, we didn't really know each other. And he, he just, you know, hey, thanks for answering my questions. Hey, no problem anytime. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to encourage him to do it mm -hmm. because it is possible. Um, so anyway, he's going to buy this car from Schrader. And, and Donnie Richardson's the crew chief who I have unbelievable amounts of respect for and i've used the schrader shop and pull down and they're incredibly generous and, and helpful mm -hmm. um yeah. nice guys over there absolutely and so they're shutting that shop down so andy's picking up the car going straight to the test is the arrangement they made and i he's like what do you think i should do after the test i'm like nothing i don't think you should do anything i think they're gonna give you a good enough car you shouldn't do a thing he goes okay can i leave my trailer at your house Yes, leave the trailer at my house. So he goes down to the test, and I believe I actually set him up with Charlie Brown to spot, who's been my longtime spotter. Mm -hmm. um, reports weren't great from the test. And I know Schrader had sold a lot of other stuff, so maybe this wasn't their, their pride and joy Speedway car. Um, so Andy comes back to the shop Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, stays in the Harry Gantt suite at our house, the apartment. <laughs> And uh, I, love oh, I love that you call it. For those that are listening in too, Andy has a, a I guess you call it what? A, a, it's an in law a granny flat. A granny yeah, yeah, flat, you yeah. call it, a, a, something like that. They named it the Harry Gantt Suite. And I don't like to describe it to many people because they need to see it in person. Um, it may be more amazing than they picture or very, very boring. <laughs> but there was a flea market purchase involved that how it became the Harry Gantt Suite. It is a spot that people check into on Facebook. Uh, the very lucky people that have stayed there and enjoyed the luxuries of the Harry Gant Who are suite. some of the famous names that have stayed in the Harry Gant oh, Suite? Oh, Mike Twist, oh, uh, Linda Twisty. Kimmel, Jamie Williams, um, okay. you know, all the Andy celebrities. Jenko, yeah. Andy Well, Andy J moved in. but <laughs> So anyway, he stayed there that night with um, Steve Mendoza, uh, Sue, Sue Lewis, Sue Cluth Lewis, and some other people. You fit three people in the Harry Gant suite. Um, There's not enough room for a single Andy bed. Andy J fit some people, whether it's a hotel <laughs> or a Harry Gant suite. They fit some people. Um, I was very honored to be one of the people that didn't have to share a bed when traveling with him. <laughs> so uh, he knows how to stretch a buck, which is you know why he gets to do what he's doing. But anyway, we unload the car. We weren't going to unload the car. And all of a sudden, the car is unloaded at my shop. And he's just not happy, and we start looking at it. At the time, John John Marlott comes over, and he's looking at the car, and he's like, man, you know, I, I think this could be better, and I think that could be better. And Andy gets to talking, and he's like, can you do this? Well, I just started my job with track house, and we can go in cup racing at any levels a lot. Mm -hmm. And John's working at, at college at the time, and it's like, no, we don't, we don't have the time to be as dedicated as we once were. Like, our gas tank was out on the – burning the midnight oils for arc races but we can help you i said nobody's gonna work on this car harder than you're gonna work on this car just like when i did it nobody would work on it as hard as i was gonna work on it so he's like well can i stay here sure and he i don't i mean last year he stayed about probably an average of half half the year every other day over the year wow. um it wasn't supposed to be like that we work on the car we we 
did a lot. Well, he goes out and he's P2 in practice to Ty Gibbs at Daytona. He's very happy. I think he hugged me. Um, <laughs> he got a top 10. And it kind of just went from there. Um, but anyway, to your point, I know I made a long version of that, but he's he is doing it. He's older. You know, but he's 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 amazing at networking, better than ever I I ever thought about being. Mm-hmm. Um, he's we've got a great thing going on with uh, Andy J and myself, Kevin Lapierre of, of Dax Market Stores. It's it's kind of a neat group. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, I haven't been able to be as hands on this year, even that I was last year, with with just how busy I am at work. But it's it's possible if you do it right. Um, it's easy to get discouraged as a driver that wants to be an ARCA or is at ARCA and trying to go on. Um, you know, I probably could have done more starts in the top three series if that's all I wanted to do. And maybe it would have been smarter, you know, to try to do the Corey LaJoy, Alex Bowman. I, I don't know if I could have done that, you know, start in the smaller teams and work your way up. Mm-hmm. But I was a little bit too competitive. Because that always doesn't work out either. No, there's a lot right. of people that have tried it doesn't. And I don't mean to sound bad or whatever, but I never thought about going racing just to go race or make laps. You want to win. I want to win. I want to know that what mm. I do tomorrow is, is a step in the right direction of what I did yesterday. You know, one of the funniest stories, i got to interrupt you. I know how competitive you are. And then Not I heard, at all. I, then I heard how competitive your mother is. Yes, <laughs> that is where that when, comes from. When you weren't good at something, she wouldn't even come to your races. <laughs> no, nope, she amazing. stopped going to my dirt racing, <laughs> which... I was driving for Armin Bove. Like you sucked, and she was like, "Well, yeah, I'm not supporting going. you." <laughs> nope. The two people that went to my dirt races was was my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and she'd drive from Boston to Canaan, New Hampshire, you, you know, on a Friday afternoon, and then I would tag along my grandfather, probably because he, he like, "Hey, Pop, get in the truck." I mm-hmm. don't even know that he knew what he was doing, you know, when I put him in the truck all the time. But those were the two people. Yeah, she um, she's pretty competitive. Stopped going to my dirt race. I finished seventh five weeks in a row, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not terrible. They sent people home. They would start 18 at these quarter-mile dirt tracks. In a They'd sprint car, it's not some, bad. I don't know what I'm doing in a sprint car. Like, I didn't know at Talladega. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, she she would stop going. But, like, that was really good competition uh, in my eye. In the scone tour of, of those days. Mm-hmm. Um, sprint cars of the Northeast or something. Sprint cars of New England. And, uh, yeah, like the top six were amazing, like multi-time track champions of all the tracks we were going to. And it wasn't good enough. No. Um, in fact, I think I was like 14 or 15 and we had started to win go-kart races. It it took me a long time to win go-kart races. I was not very good. Um, we finished second and she threw her clipboard after the race like papers everywhere the two the whole dual stopwatch clipboard that every mom had throws the clipboard and asks my, my dad and I why did we suck today I love and it you, was, mom it was and my dad as calm as he is just looks at her pretty sternly and goes go sit in the truck just go sit in the truck she knew she messed up we load up the cart we finish second we sit in the car. I remember he puts his hands on the steering wheel. He's just looking straight forward. I'm thinking she she must have been sitting in the back. Maybe I got shotgun. And he turns to her and goes, do you think we have to be told we suck today? Do you think we don't know that we suck today? Is that telling us and pointing out that we suck today? Is that going to help? And I still, I mean, just, I can remember every word, but it's just great. Do you think we need to know or be oh, reminded God. that we suck today? Is that what you think? But she, um, we like, we can't, I refuse to play Monopoly in my family as far as being competitive. We're with your mom. Any, you just, any of us. She's just the most competitive. I know. Um, miniature golf is about the most competitive thing we can do against each other. Like racing, we're all with each other on the same team. But my dad like gets quiet, incredibly competitive, focused. He wants like holes in ones or two every time. So my mom's not that good at it. So she just cheats. You have to watch her for kicking the ball, just slightly rolling the ball with the golf club. Like Win if you can, lose if you must, but always cheat, right? That's I mean, she is just will not lose to the rest of the family. She's pretty competitive. You know, I, what I, one of the things that I do love about your mom, too, is that 
Anytime you stop by your pit at the racetrack, she's always got a buffet line of food, and she's got it there. How many times that I didn't go hungry during the course of a day at the track because your mom fed me or, or something? There, are, you know, those days at the track. You know, I, obviously, you guys are doing your thing, working on the race cars, and, and you're focused on that. I'm running up and down pit road, talking to every driver and crew I, I, I can talk to. So you forget to eat for all intents and purposes and I've walked past or walked over to the trailer and been like Bobby I'm starving can you help me out and yep sure darling you know oh, yeah. everybody's I joke darling around, she's a 137% Italian so that everybody has to make sure they're fed um, you know in the middle 2000s when the economy got bad uh, we didn't know if we were going to be racing not racing and we we're trying to figure out how to save money going racing and even the crew guys were like you know we don't need all this food we could she would make us sandwiches for the ride to the track then get to the track get the grill out and do more and they're like you know the sandwiches are just fine you know we can do hot dogs or we can buy our own food from the from the uh, snack shack and so me and my dad decide we're gonna approach my mom about how much money she's spending on food when we go racing because we need to spend more on tires and parts we strategize, and this is how we're going to... We knew this was dangerous. <laughs> and uh, You're trying so, to be as tactful as possible, yeah, right? Yeah, so we approach her, and she listened, and she didn't say anything. And I think it went something like, do I tell you how many fucking tires to buy? <laughs> do I tell you that you should buy one less this How many week? engines? And she mm-hmm. goes, I, and she likes to take care of people. Don't tell me. Not to take care of people. Oh, I know. So that was the first, only, and last time that that conversation would ever be had. Ever happened. You no. Know, and uh, <laughs> so in, we're 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 getting close to, to the end of the show. We we've been jumping around a little bit. It, actually, now we're gonna actually go backwards a little bit to your origins in the sport, or or running the modified your modified years. I mean, you ran a modified for quite a while up in the Northeast. Uh, you didn't really run the NASCAR Whelan Modified Tour per se, but you had some pretty big wins. You won Oktoberfest and then won the championship down in New Smyrna yep. for uh, the World Series. A- at what point did you th- did you think that I'm going to go Southern Modified Tour racing? Or was that something that you were looking into? Because obviously the big break for you in the Southern Modified Tour was when you won at Nashville. Yes. You know, in your own family's car and all that. And from there, it went to driving for the Riggs team, which had been around for generations. Then Eddie Harvey, your own car. You won two championships with Eddie. Uh, how did it all? How did it all come about? You know, with you know, the modified and racing and all that. Well, it's funny, you know. As far as not running the tour, um, we didn't race our car as much as people think. Um, we did some the MRS the early MRS we chased most of the races I think one year we did all the points races Mm -hmm. um but we just couldn't we simply couldn't um and I guess it's flattering that people associate that car with modified racing in the northeast and how much we did because we did get to win some big races not on the tour but you know the MRS races and and some other things Oktoberfest was huge yeah the DAV Memorial um was my first ever tour mod win but it basically started, you know, I was racing Star Speedway. And, I mean, that was a dream come true. 350 Super Modifieds. I'm a huge Super Modified fan. My dad would take me to um, Star Speedway every Saturday, which I should probably clarify that I dragged my dad to Star Speedway <laughs> most Saturdays. He probably wanted a Saturday off. But he, he's just as much of racing, nothing loved as much as me. And the boat shop closed at 2 o'clock. I mean, it, it, on Saturday, we, we would go there. And it was a dream to go do that. And when things started going better with, with the business, you know, we, we got a super modified. And um, I was just, I love this stuff. To this day, I love this stuff. But I was 17 years old, can't get enough of this. Um, I'm at Lee Oktoberfest before I ever ran a modified. You know, I'm the first one at the gate. I drive that that trailer, and I'm the first one unloaded. I, wait, I'm wait, showing wait. my car off. Real quick, off. I just interrupt you. Were you racing the 350 Supers at the same time Bobby Santos was? Just after. 
Just okay. Jet Bobby it, had moved on to big blocks and, and, right, and that, USAC and all that. Because that was like the big phenom thing. He was like twelve or thirteen years old winning yeah. these super modified races. And we all kind of wanted to follow in his footsteps. I'd still someday love to be Bobby Santos. I'm a big <laughs> Bobby Santos fan. He's he's an incredible natural talent. Um, well, and, you, but you have two championships and he has one, so you know you can always leverage that. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's funny <laughs> how like people compare um, careers. Yeah. And and you never think yours is as good as the one you want. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm a big Bobby Santos fan. I'm a big John McKennedy fan. Mm-hmm. And all the different things Another he did. Another Star Speedway graduate. We ran our first go-kart race together when we were 10 years old, and we still race against each other now. So that's 25 years ago. And uh, still race against each other. But it was funny talking to him one time and he didn't say it to me i just heard him talking to my mom he goes well you know we can't all be like andy living the dream down south here i am thinking he's got the world just at his fingertips full-time super modified ride modified ride you know great rides uh driving for tommy Baldwin, all these things i'm like man i'd, I'd give you know up my deal to, to swap spots with him but but anyway we we go to oktoberfest and i unload this 350 super and I mean, like a car show, right? I am just proud of this thing. Like, look, I want to lean up against this thing. I want people to see me. Well, next to us is uh, Gary Casella pulls up. Mm-hmm. And we just get to talk. And, and Gary's super nice guy. They got a short field of modifieds for Oktoberfest. And he says, hey, if you want to buy two right side tires for my backup modified, I'll bring it up here tomorrow. You can start last in the feature. Okay. Sounds good. This is this is an amazing. This is a ride, you know. Right. And uh, figure out how to pay for two tires. And Gary's a super nice guy. Great, great guy. Yeah. Um, well, we unload, and I am scared of this car because the 350 Super. It's down on horsepower, but it's got a wing, but it's got 10 inch slicks. So everybody's going. You are going to slide in this modified. It's got you know 600 horsepower. You don't have a wing. You are going to burn the tires off this thing. You're going to be junk. So I get in this race car, and I mean, I don't have practice. I'm starting this race. Like, I can't believe Gary actually let me do it. It's kind of foolish on his part. So you hopped in the car cold with no yes. warm-ups, no nothing. Just go right to the feature. Yep. And uh, I'm sitting in the back, scared that I'm going to burn the tires off this car, which proves to be a pretty good strategy at Lee. Next thing you know, it's like, you know, a handful of laps to go. I'm like, all right, I'm going to stand up in the seat. And we start passing some cars, and we're going to the front. And I think we were, like, up to third – I get put in the grass into turn one with a handful of laps to go. Caution doesn't come out. I regroup, finish 10th. But it's like, hey, this is kind of neat. So, uh, you know, not to drag it on too long, we go to New Smyrna with Gary's car. We end up purchasing Gary's car um, with a building loan, a construction loan to go racing. (laughs) I think it's been long enough. We can't get in trouble if I admit that now. And meet... Jerry Morello. Jerry Morello, we put a, put a car together, and a uh, very interesting guy. Ben was like a mentor to me in racing. He did a lot of things. Um, still a guy that I probably owe a phone call, just like I hadn't seen you in two years, but he helped me out a year ago trying to, another side business that I wanted to get going. And uh, But anyway, we, we get MRS racing. Uh, Jerry has his issues. He goes away for a while, mm-hmm. and we're running our own car, and, and we just can't afford to do it. You know, um, so we're racing here, or there, and, and getting things. The other thing, if if you can picture it, it was easier to do New Smyrna because we're in the boat business. Mm-hmm. So summer's harder. We can't race every weekend. Um, I say that most times we ended up racing every weekend, but different different ways, different things. <laughs> and it's the same way with the Southern Tour. It starts earlier in the year before the boat business gets bigger. And then the next thing was at the time there was no pit stops on the Southern Tour. We literally went down with four of us in a, in a truck, in a trailer. You had a spotter, two mechanics in the infield. Like, you were good. To go race the tour at Thompson, you know, you needed guys going over the wall. You needed pit support behind the wall. You needed all this stuff. It was hard to assemble that many people, get people to practice pit stops. And then the next thing is just afford to do it. So we did New Smyrna. Um, we had a little bit of money left in the account. We wrecked the car. And my dad said, if you can fix the car we'll go to Nashville or we'll, we'll pay. We were having Northeast race cars do all our chassis work at the time. Mm-hmm. And we, we had like a little homemade jig that we kind of were tinkering with. Cause I was in vocational welding school with, with my, my best friend, Jordan, uh, Mike, Mike Holmes, Bobby Freeman. 
and we put this car back together. We took bent clips and put it together to where we thought went to Nashville and won. And won the race. Yeah, and like just, I mean, that, that was the first time pulled into victory lane. They had the guitar. Um, you know, you, you had mentioned rigs. Well, the next week we literally unloaded the car. Didn't take the load tire off the right front that you need to get a modified in the trailer, backed it in, went to work. You know, it's, it's getting to be busy season. And my dad Friday comes to me and goes, Hey, how are you looking for the, the week? I said, I'm not too bad. I got most of my work done. How long does it take to get to Greenville Pickens? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't even know where that is. He goes, well, that's South where Carolina. the Southern race is. And, um, Went home at lunch, put the car in the trailer, and left. And it was four of us in a truck. And there, I see Junior Jeff. Miller won that race, if I'm not Junior mistaken. Junior Miller won the race, but okay. Jeff Riggs comes to me. And I mean, like, you know, I won the week before. Didn't expect to win. Never won a NASCAR tour race. Um, he says, hey, you. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I, I, I must have upset this guy at Nashville. Come see me in my trailer as soon as you're done here. We're at the NASCAR trailer signing in. Okay. And he proposes to go drive for them. And that's, it took a while, but that's the, you know, the short version. Uh -huh. um, and when I get a little bit of harassment, why I didn't spend more time on the Northern tour or why I d didn't do this. And I, I just tell people simply like David and Jeff Riggs asked me to drive their race car. Mm -hmm. Eddie Harvey asked me to drive a race car. Those are championship right. contending teams. Bob Garbarino never asked me to drive his race car. Right. Eddie Partridge never asked me. I never got those phone calls. So people give me a hard time about not focusing on the Northern Tour, but like, you know, we're we're getting better now when we show up with our 70 car. And, and you know, we sat on the pole at Loudoun uh, two years ago at, at the 250. And, you know, we've, we're knocking out some top 10s, top 5s. But it's a tough tour. And yeah. we just never had the right... Every, all the stars align so why would you go spin your wheels and lose a lot of money on something you couldn't give 100 percent effort so that's why we ended up doing what we did that and i also think that you and ted christopher probably would have been running into each other every week <laughs> we mean, found each other a lot god, even though we didn't race god love teddy and he's he uh he has definitely earned his right in the modified racing hall of fame and 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 all those accolades but man you guys ran into each other a lot you guys had some rivalry teddy and i got along to the point he actually found me at loudon one time and asked me to go practice his car at canaan so if I remember correctly, it was like Friday qualifying at Loudon, or maybe Friday race, and then we had Saturday off not doing anything. He was driving Kirk Shelmerdine's car and had to qualify the cup car at Loudon. And he says, hey, I can't get it Canaan. There's an open race. I wasn't running it because we had our car set up for Loudon. Will you go practice the car? I mean, that, that was neat. I mean, the king asked me to shake his car down. Right. Well... I, and I'm not saying I'm better than Ted Christopher or whatever for what I'm about to say, but I went faster than him in practice. Mm -hmm. I did not have new tires in practice. He did. I had the old tires. Joe Brady might have had those tires better than new, the practice tires. I might have had some help there. But when Teddy went on to finish second, uh, he said, what do you think to Joe? And Joe says, I think we might have maybe should have left Andy in the car. <laughs> kind of as a jab, but that was the end of me and Teddy getting along. Really? And I remember, uh, you know, just, just hearing things he said after that. And we go down to New Smyrna. He wrecked me in practice. He wrecked me on night one, wrecked me on night two. We had a pretty good epic battle at Star Speedway that people still, you know, always point out. I mean, he put me off the backstretch multiple times in the infield multiple times. Um, it was a great race. Uh, but, yeah, I, I actually had a car owner ask me. Um, and, and maybe this is part of my problem and the way my brain works, but he asked me like, maybe, you know, when, when you get that second tap from Ted Christopher, you know, maybe just think about letting him buy. And I, I mean, looking back, it probably wasn't the right thing to say to a car owner. And I looked at him saying, I said, if you never say that to me again, that'll be just fine. <laughs> and I guess that's the Teddy's competitiveness and, and, you know, I just wasn't moving over for anybody. And I don't know if that for a while there, yeah, we had a pretty good rivalry which I didn't win as many races. I didn't win as many championships as Ted Christopher, but to be considered his rival at one point, there was our little time is pretty neat. Did you guys eventually make up or, or um, patch things over? No, not really. really? I think they got a little bit more lighthearted towards the end. So 
first of all, like you got to remember, Ted was just getting in and out of race cars. It didn't bother him. Where I took it personal. That's my race car, my money. At this point, we're building clips ourselves. We're like, it's time, it's money, it's it's all that stuff. I took it very personal, which, I mean, at the time, like, I don't, I probably would have handled it differently now. But if it got to the point like it was back then, I would still take it personal. Um, but I'm doing better at, I try to keep the racetrack separate than the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And I back then, I, I lived it with Ted Christopher. I was mad. Uh, he did a good job keeping it light because as you can picture in Ted and everybody does their Ted voice, all of a sudden I'd hear, Hey, Seuss. And I'd look and I'd like kind of just nicely like go to wave. Hey, how's it going? And I realized it was Ted. And just the fact that he got me to look, I would stop waving, probably get like a, you know, mad face on. And he loved it. He, <laughs> he knew he got he knew he me. He could get under your skin. So he, but at that point, like. And he would say, like, why are you always mad at me? Like, I'm like, Ted, I don't like the way you drive me. I got just, I didn't. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would have loved to have a better relationship with him, and you, you know, and uh, unfortunately won't have that chance. But, uh, you know, like a lot of people that I've butted heads with and had rivalries through the year, it's, it's kind of neat just to know we were two competitors going after the same real estate. From we're almost about to wrap it up, but uh, from an outside set of eyes looking in, who do you think is like one of the best in modified racing right now? Matt Hirschman. Yeah, I mean you can't not say Matt Hirschman. Um, you know Ryan Priest is incredibly impressive. Um, I think what Doug Kobe did over the last decade is absolute history. I think what Justin Bonsignor is doing, and a lot of that is just incredible teams too. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've got a lot of a lot of envy on on the, and my guys are amazing. Don't get me wrong. I got the guys that still come from New Hampshire, right. wherever I race, whenever I race. But you know, just all those pieces put together is very impressive. Right. Um, I'm gonna throw out that I'm a big fan of Matthew Kimball in uh, Claremont, Monadnock, New Hampshire ranks. Um, I think he's probably somebody that if he gets the right opportunity will 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 do things. And there's so many. I, I I'm a fan of Kyle Sopers mm-hmm. um out, out at Riverhead. He's a talented kid, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I try to be supportive of people that I, I think are good and, and deserve that. You know, like I said, we get so competitive that mm-hmm. sometimes as racers we don't want to hear another nice thing about any other driver because we, <laughs> we just wanna be the best. But uh yeah, Matt Matt Hirschman's impressive in, in what actually, when you race with those guys and when you can beat those guys, it, it means that much more. Some of my favorite wins are because I beat some of those guys. Right, I understand. And uh, Matt Hirschman and I had a lot of good runs there for a while when I was able to run the modified more and um, always always a class act. I mean, that guy gives you the width of the race car. And that's it. That's it. Yeah, I gave you a rule. You're never going to hit Matt Hirschman's nerf bar in the wall at the same time. If you hit his nerf bar, you know, you probably crowded him and could it, but then you move up just an inch and then you hit the wall and you're like, man, this guy knew right where to run me. Mm -hmm. He's incredibly good. I think the moment he gets to the racetrack, he's thinking about how to win from where the hauler gets parked and every decision after that is 100% thought out by him probably a week before he ever got to the track <laughs> and uh yeah he's he's very um no bs when, yeah. when he shows up show show up work on the car get it dialed in kick everybody's butt go home yep, yep. It, it, you know what I, I i love that pure racing because a lot of people show up and you know it, it is their time away from work and, and it's their vacation and they treat it as such but everybody on that race team seems very goal minded you know I mean they they know what they're there for cool well before we go uh, you said that you had some kind of surprise for me I don't don't know what you were is it getting hot in here I think it's I gotta (laughs) hold on let me let me take my long sleeve off here oh god what are you wearing no I'm just just kind of (laughs) warm just kind of warm what the hell is that get to my t-shirt here what the hell is that I love oh, just, <laughs> just a huge. I love DP. Show it to that camera right there. I love DP. Show you may you might not want to let too many people know that information, but Derek, I love you, and I wanted to get this shirt. You've been a, a good friend of mine. 
<laughs> big supporter, let me on this show. I love DP TV, the real DP show. I love it all. Um, so I wanted to get this. Uh, for whatever reason, my wife says I can't wear it out of the house next to her. Well, she can I, just let her it, wear it. I, I, I don't know that she doesn't love you as much as I do. I picture this shirt probably never making it out of the laundry again. Uh, I... I had to send it to, I don't even have an Amazon account so that I don't spend too much. I had to send her the link, order this shirt, and I think she may have learned some other, uh, mm -hmm. you know, reasons that mm -hmm. yeah. people love DP uh, after that. But I'm just a we're big just gonna, Derek. We're going to stop I, right there. I'm just a big Derek Pernasiglio fan. And uh, when I when I went to buy a shirt online, this was the, the closest one I could find. Well, you could tell everybody it's Dr. Pepper. You, you like I love Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I do. Well, Andy, thank you for coming in. That shirt is great. I got to get, get one for myself. Everybody should have one. <laughs> Andy Sice joins us on the Derek Pernasiglio Show. We want to thank him for coming into the studio. And as always, we'll see you the next time. Bye.